I'm Herb Lin from Stanford University, and I'm supposed to know something about principles of security as they apply to cybersecurity. And this is my daughter's cat, Pounce. And I'm supposed to know more about security than he does. But you know something? This cat beat me at almost every effort that I made to confine him. And the rest of this video is a story about how cats can teach you something about cybersecurity. This lovely feline here is Pounce, my daughter's cat. For some context, what happened is that when my daughter came to live with me, she had a cat that she wanted to bring into the house. I'm allergic to cats. And so the deal that I struck with her was that she would agree to keep the cat confined to her bedroom and a bathroom and wouldn't let the cat come out. And I was, of course, going to put up some security measures to make sure that the cat stayed confined to his uh, appropriate area. So the first thing I did, I tried to put a magnet on a set of French doors that would hold the doors together. Well, he just pushed through them. Yeah, okay. Then I put a hook on the doors, a little latch, in which case he went underneath the door. So then I tried to block the path underneath the door. What did I use? Well, I just used the cardboard and, and, and taped it, thinking that it would just block him. Well, it blocked him for a little bit, but he scratched at it and scratched at it and scratched at it and tore the cardboard off. And you can see how this is going, right? So what happened was that every time I did something, I did it on the cheap. I did the minimal effort thing possible to fix the problem. But what I really should have done was to go in all in sooner rather than later. Even then, of course, it's not success isn't guaranteed, but at least you have a better chance. So well, in cybersecurity, what happens is that everybody tries to do cybersecurity on the cheap. They try to minimize their cybersecurity cybersecurity expenses because they don't want to spend all that money on something that sort of doesn't add anything to the product. Well, what happens then is, of course, they pay more later and they pay more later and they pay more later because eventually the criminals will get through. So that's the first lesson. The second lesson that I learned is that Pounce has unlimited time to try to get out. He just tries and tries and tries until he succeeds. And he only needs to succeed once to get out. Whereas all of my confinement measures have to work to keep him confined. It's the same thing with cybersecurity. If I do something with cybersecurity, they have to work all of the time everywhere as the defender. But the attacker only has to succeed once to get in. That's clearly a big advantage to the attacker. I have to be perfect. The attacker can only be competent once. He can be competent every other time, but he can only be competent once and he can get in. Third thing. I learned, of course, is that when the cat tries to do something and doesn't succeed, cat incurs no penalty for failure. That is, cat doesn't get punished. Why not? Well, I would be in a lot of trouble if I did try to punish that cat. So I didn't punish. So the cat just gets to try once, try again, try again, try again. Eventually, they'll probably succeed. It's the same thing with hacking. A hacker incurs mostly no penalty for an unsuccessful hacking attempt. In fact, if the defenses keep out the hacker, sometimes nobody even notices that the hacker tried. So there's no penalty for a hacker, usually, for a failed attempt at doing something. Only it's when he succeeds. In this kind of environment, a hacker can just try and try and try and try until he succeeds. And this is not a recipe for success. Next lesson is that the cat has, Pounce has a very powerful protector, my daughter, whose wrath I am unwilling to confront for diplomatic reasons. That is, for example, if I try to devise a method of keeping the Pounce confined in such a way that Pounce might be injured or be hurt, my daughter would be very mad at me. I would be in a lot of trouble. Under these circumstances, there are many things that I'm not willing to do because of her wrath. Similarly, a hacker may operate under protection 
of a foreign government if they operate from their territory. So take some nation, Elbonia, for example, uh, and the Elbonian government may tell the hacker, you know, you can do whatever you want. Just don't hack in Elbonian, Elbonian system. But as long as you hack somebody else, we don't care and we'll protect you from anybody else, okay? And under these circumstances, if some of these people, so hackers in Elbonia try to hack a computer in the United States and the US wants to complain about it, what's the US gonna do? Going to go into Elbonia, it'll go to the Elbonian government and it'll say, uh, please give us these hackers. They'll say no, or we don't have any idea what you're talking about, go away. Okay? US can't force a change in, in, in the state's behavior unless it's willing to take much stronger action than just a diplomatic protest. Next lesson in this, I can be lulled into a false sense of security because it looks like I'm winning the battle to keep counts confined right up until the moment that I see that count is outside the confinement area, right? So what happens is that I think I'm succeeding, I think, think I'm succeeding, and I think I'm succeeding because I don't see the cat. And lo and behold, there's Pounce sitting over there with a smile on his face, scratching my sofa. I wish I didn't have this false sense of security, but I do because I don't see any evidence of hacking, of, of catting. Okay? Similarly, an organization often regards a lack of reports regarding cybersecurity breaches as evidence of security, even though what the lack of evidence may mean is that the hackers have done a very good job of covering up their tracks. So let's say you're a hacker and what you, one of the things you wanna do if when you beat a security mechanism is to make the defender, me, think that I have been successful. So you try to erase all the evidence that you were there. And I'm looking at this, I see that I, apparently nothing is wrong. I'm not highly motivated to look to see if my perception is right. So I stop looking and that's where the hacker has me. And then now I'm convinced that everything is just fine. And the hacker, no, nah, the hacker knows that he's gotten away with something. The next thing on all this is that Pounce has a very, very different perspective on the world than I do. Why? His head is six inches off the floor. Mine is, I don't know, five foot eight inches off, no, five foot six or something like that, you know, at, at eye level off the floor, okay? We see the world very differently. With his only six inches off the floor, he's in a much better position to see the environment, to see ways of circumventing or destroying my defensive measures that I can't see because I'm looking at it from above. He's down at ground level. I'm not. So what's the cybersecurity lesson here? If you're an organization, you want somebody helping you who is able to look at it from the standpoint of the bad guy. And you know, many organizations are reluctant to hire former hackers. And they ignore the fact that it is exactly such people that will be in the best place to identify security vulnerabilities. That is, they know what to look for. You don't but they do and you need their expertise. And if you don't hire them, you don't get their expertise. Now, I agree there are all kinds of questions there about how do you know that they've gone straight and all that sort of stuff. And I agree that there are risks and I understand that. Nevertheless, there is a, there's a body of expertise there that many organizations would be well advised to tap into. And my daughter, loyalties often influence the security situation on the ground. Pounce is able to look in my daughter's eyes and mew plaintively. And then what does my daughter do? She just opens up the door and Pounce walks out, thereby circumventing all of my security measures. And what am I gonna do? Kick my daughter out? Can't do that, right? So my daughter has now turned against me. It was her agreement. She agreed 100% that she would keep the cat confined. Pounce would stay within his designated area. But she just said, eh, 
I don't need to respect that agreement. Pounce wants to get out, I'm gonna let him out. Similarly, it is often the case that the most dangerous cybersecurity threat is the insider, is the trusted insider that goes rogue on you. Why? Because the trusted insider has all of the privileges and all of the knowledge that would characterize somebody on the inside. They know how to circumvent all of the security measures. They know how to turn off um, access controls and all that sort of stuff. And so if that person goes rogue, you're in a world of hurt and you better have security measures in place to deal with that possibility as I did not with my daughter. Finally, I eventually did win the battle to keep counts confined. That is out of my area. How did I do that? My daughter moved out and took counts with her. Therefore, no more cat. So there is even a cybersecurity lesson in that. Without a computer to be compromised, cyber attacks are not feasible. So don't use computers when you don't have to. The world seems to want to think that more computers mean something is better. And without really thinking about whether or not those computers actually will make life much better, or at least giving the user the option. So those are some of the lessons that Pounce taught me. And perhaps you can learn something from them too. That, you know, I'm a higher mammal. I'm supposed to be able to outsmart a cat. And yet I was totally unsuccessful at this. And perhaps you can see that there are useful cybersecurity lessons in this uh, as well. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>